is 1 Samuel chapter 26, beginning in verse 1. This is God's word, eternally true. The Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hakalah, which faces Jeshimon? So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hakalah facing Jeshimon. But David stayed in the desert. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had lain down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. David then asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai the son of Zariah, Joab's brother, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, The Lord himself will strike him either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the, on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head, and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head, and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away. There was a wide space between them. He called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your lord, the king? Someone came to destroy your lord, the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men deserve to die because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, my lord, the king. And he added, Why is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? And what wrong am I guilty of? Now, let my Lord the King listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, men have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have now driven me from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, Go serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea, as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way, 
and Saul returned home. Here ends this reading from God's word. You have a response of thankfulness that's printed for you there in your bulletins. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. There's been a debate in the uh, sports world about the uh, National Basketball Association's most valuable player ever since LeBron James has gone into the NBA. And, And the question is, can you give him the MVP award every year? And the answer by vote is no. You can't. They, they typically give it to the, the person who's having an outstanding season that year. But one of the elements that comes up in the discussion each year is the value of the player. After all, the award is called most valuable player. Uh, and, and the discussion is this. Whatever team LeBron is on is in the NBA Finals. Uh, in, indeed, for uh, while he was down in Miami, uh, his team went to the NBA Finals all those years, and then he went to a, 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 a very poor team in Cleveland, Ohio, and immediately that team was in the Finals every year. He was on the team, and he just left Cleveland, and now he's in Los Angeles with the Lakers, and guess what? Cleveland, the team that was in the Finals last year with him on the team, they're in the gutter, and they're in the running for getting the first draft pick. Out of, col- out of the college pool of, of athletes. Because as the discussion has gone, he has so much value to whatever, he's te- whatever team he's on. Whether you like him or, or not, his value is, is great. Uh, when we look at this passage here, we're looking at something God teaches us about one who is anointed, or sometimes it's referred to one who is ordained. And, and uh, we see that David gets this. Saul doesn't get it. Abishai doesn't get it. But David gets it. If you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to do that. If that helps you follow along and, and sees, it helps you track. Uh, if you want to just listen, that's fine too. But uh, God says to us this morning from this text, consider and treat the ordained or anointed man Jesus as valuable and precious. Those are the two words used in this passage. You can look down there in in verse 8. Abishai uh, doesn't consider Saul uh, precious or valuable, but David does. Verse 9, David says, look there in verse 9, don't destroy him. Who can lay a, a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Verse 11, but the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Um, He says uh, this too in in verse 15. You look down here, David said, you're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard the Lord your king? Um, He says uh, there, uh, as surely as the Lord lives in verse 16, you and your men deserve to die because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. So this word anointed should pop out at you as you read this text. It's 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 in here. This verse, that verse, this verse, that verse, and it's a main feature of what's going on here. And David says that that uh, Abner, the chief uh, army officer of Saul, that he and his whole army deserved death because they didn't protect the Lord's anointed, Saul. So that's a message for us that. Jesus, uh, the anointed, the ordained one for us, should be treated, his life should be treated, he should be treated as as precious and valuable to us. A little bit of explanation, A there in your outline, ordained and anointed to speak to a man, being set apart by God, set apart by God for service in and for his kingdom. And so this had happened um, uh, already uh, many times in, in Israel. Uh, and Exodus 29, Leviticus 16 there, uh, this was something that was done for the priests. And Moses was to ordain and anoint. Both used or words, both words are used there in both of those passages. That's what that Moses did for Aaron and his sons when he was setting them apart for service in the kingdom of God, to have a service that was beneficial to God's people. They were set apart through this 
ceremonial yet substantive anointing and ordination. And so they were anointed with, with oil and, and put spe special garments were put upon them. So that's what ordination, that's what anointing is about, being set apart for service in and for the sake of those who are in God's kingdom. B, there in your outline, in 1 Samuel, we see that Saul was ordained. Saul was anointed. Um, he was anointed. David insisted on treating him well because of this, despite Saul's treatment of him. So that's the amazing thing in this text, that David says, you know, Saul's, he's tried to kill David, I don't know how many times now. You know, in, in his very presence, when Saul slings a spear across at him a couple of times, but he's, this situation has happened before. The, the Ziphites are kind of scoundrels. They go and tattle on, on where David is hiding. This is the second time they've done this, where they've come to Saul. They did it in an earlier chapter. And, and they, they, they want to get in good with Saul. And so they, they, rat, out, they rat out David. Um, and so David's having to live away from the land. He's off in the desert. He's hiding in caves. And this is all because of Saul. The people loved David. They sang his praise. You know, Saul has killed his thousands. David has tens of thousands. The whole reason David was in misery, the whole the reason David was suffering, all of David's persecution came because of this one man, Saul. Yet, uh, chapter 10, verse 1, Saul had been anointed. Samuel the prophet, Samuel the priest, anointed Saul. And even though Saul, we read, was the people's choice for a king, not the Lord's, David was the Lord's choice, even though Saul was the people's choice for the king, he had still been anointed, set apart to be king over God's people. And we looked in an earlier chapter that God extended his blessings to Saul. Then had Saul continued to walk in faithfulness, that blessing would have continued. And we see the tragedy of Saul not walking in faithfulness to God because his son Jonathan was such a, a, a faithful person and would have been a great heir, heir to the throne. So Saul was, was anointed, and this is the source of David's treating Saul well. So put in other words, David treats a scoundrel well because that scoundrel sits in the office of ordained or anointed leader of God's people. C. David was also God's anointed. He had been set apart in chapter 16. When, when God rejects Saul as king for repeated unfaithfulness, uh, God sends Samuel the prophet to Bethlehem and has uh, Samuel specifically anoint David as king and declares this upon him. And so this had happened back in chapter 16. So David was God's anointed, and Saul should have treated him well. That's your next blank. But he didn't. The proper response of Saul, having heard from God's own prophet and priest Samuel that the kingship had been stripped from him, Saul's right response was, well, is there another who would serve these people and lead them? And a person that I can serve and help. Uh, but Saul doesn't do this. He's jealous of David, and that's why he's, he's chasing him around. But, but uh, Saul should be treating David well, as we saw last chapter. Abigail understood. David had a forever kingdom pronounced upon him, a lasting dynasty. And so Saul should treat him well, but he, but he doesn't. Now, D, in the line of, of David and as son of David, Jesus is God's anointed. We saw that in Luke chapter 3. And uh, John the Baptist, who's described in almost identical terms to, Saul, to Samuel the prophet, including what his parents were like and, and how he was set apart from birth and his service among God's people. Um, just as Samuel had anointed David, John the Baptist anoints Jesus. Then he anoints him. What's going on there with the baptism? He's anointed as king. God the Father proclaims from heaven, this is my son. That means he was king. Okay, for uh, uh, 2 Samuel 7, 14. Uh, the, the king of God's people was his special son. 
uh, he will be a, he will be my son I will be his father and so Jesus is anointed he's set apart as king as leader for God's for God's people um, and so Jesus refers to this as he goes to the Nazareth synagogue after his time in, of 40 days of testing in the wilderness and he says the Lord has anointed me he's referring to his baptism by John the Baptist where John the Baptist anointed him with water but also the Holy Spirit came upon him in full measure and took the form of a, a dove signaling to John the Baptist that, that this was God anointing Jesus to service in his kingdom as king. And so uh, Jesus said uh, in John uh, 10, 32, I have shown you many miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Um, he should have been treated well by God's people. Jesus was anointed as king. John the Baptist, who had created all this hubbub and that people admired and respected, told his own disciples, follow him. And so his disciples start following Jesus. John the Baptist says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, John the Baptist does, I must decrease, but Jesus must increase. And so this great respect should have been given to Jesus. He should have been treated well by his people, but instead Jesus is encountering one peril after another in front of his people, including stoning. Uh, chapter 16 of John, verse 10. Jesus said, because I'm righteous, I'll be received by my Father. Um, Jesus was righteous. He should have been respected. He should have been honored. He should have been valued and, and treated as precious. John 18, 38, Pilate declares, I find no basis for charge against him. That was Pilate, neutral party, he examines Jesus, talks to him, listens to those who are accusing Jesus. And Pilate's conclusion is, I find no basis for charge against him. Yet, his very own people, as John says in, in, in uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. And so his people declare what, what we see with, that uh, Bob read to us. Uh, Pilate says to the Jews, what shall I do with your king? Pilate understands better than God's people do. Jesus has been anointed as king and he should be treated well. What do you want me to do with him? I see no basis of charge against him. And they say, crucify him. He says, crucify your king? And they say, in ultimate betrayal, we have no king but Caesar. They didn't treat him well. They made sure he got, upon, he got upon a cross. And so Peter says to the people of his day, Bob read it to you from Acts 2, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Think of this with David. He had defeated all God's enemies that had come into the promised land or who were living in the promised land and not allowing God's people to prosper. David had accomplished all these things for them, uh, ridding the land of their enemies. Which, and God did these things through Jesus, as you yourselves know, Peter tells the Jews after Jesus' resurrection. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. So Jesus should have been treated well, but he wasn't. So why do we talk about this? Well, number one, apart from, apart from God, you are without God's spirit. We know this from Jude 19, John 3, 3. Jesus says a, a man can't be in the kingdom of God unless he's been born again, born of the spirit, born from above. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says what sets us apart from the world is we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And so apart from God, you're without God's spirit. And then number two, recognize you are like Abishai and Saul. If you and I were there in front of Pilate, we would have been shouting, crucify him. 
This was true for all who did not have God's Spirit. The only reason you would have been like somebody like one of the Marys or would have been like someone like John who manages to, in a sneaky way, show up at the cross. Um, but even Jesus' disciples have run from him. Apart from God's Spirit, you shall crucify him. And this is what Paul essentially says in Colossians 1.21 before you had God's spirit, you were alienated from God and hostile in mind to him. That's hostile in mind, shouting crucify him, isn't it? See how that fits up. We're not the good guys. Again, we say this every once in a while in scripture. We're not the good guys. When we read scripture, we're the bad guys. That's who we are apart from the spirit of God. And we, that's who John Musgrave is, apart from the spirit of God. That's who Carl Morris is, apart from the Spirit of God. Shouting, crucify him. Not the other people who aren't as spiritual as you. You, shouting, crucify him. Not treating the Lord's anointed as he deserves. So three, you not having the spirits in dwelling would have been no different than the Jews and Pilate in Jesus' day, and would have been joined would have joined in the demanding of the killing of the Lord's anointed Jesus. I'll read that again. That has a lot of blanks. I not having the spirits and dwelling would have been no different with, than the Jews and Pilate in Jesus' day, and I would have joined in the demanding of the killing of the Lord's anointed Jesus. Just like Abishai said that he sees the Lord's anointed below his feet and says. Let me kill him with my spear. I'll run him. I'll, I'll, I'll nail him through. I won't have to do it twice. I'll just, I'll, it'll be so thorough. He'll just be instantly dead. Or Saul. Saul had no respect for the Lord's anointed. David had been anointed. And he should have respected that. Instead, he was making the Lord's anointed live in caves and run away. And, oh, that sounds like Teletubbies. And, and run, run away. And, and uh, and he was trying to kill him. Um, so that's who we are, alienated from God, enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior, is how Colossians 1.21 puts it, um, saying we have no king but Caesar. That's the state of the non-believer. That's the state of the non-Christian. Jesus is not my king. Uh, I have no king but um, whoever's the president of the United States. And if he's not a good one, I'm going to get on social media and talk about it a lot. Um, but we have a king that we don't have to complain about on social media, right? Uh, our, our king is Jesus. We own him because we have the Spirit of God. Uh, but if we don't own him, um, apart from God's Spirit, Apart from not respecting and honoring and treating as precious the Lord's anointed, this deserves, number four, this deserves death. That's what David points out. He says, Abner, your job is to protect the Lord's anointed. And we could have killed him 20 times over. We were right beside him. Look, where's his spear? Where's his water jug that we're sitting right by his head? We can prove it, in other words. And so you and your whole army, you deserve death because you were sleeping on the job. And that's true for us. So that's verse 10 there. Um, we deserve death because we do not respect the Lord's anointed Jesus uh, like we should. And that was the case for us before faith in Jesus, before we began to respect him as the Lord's anointed, before we said, he's the Lord's anointed, I need to follow him. I need his protection for my well-being. And, and that brings us to, to this, A, eh? salvation from death, from the death we deserve, salvation from the death we deserve, is really about how we treat Jesus. That's what separates everything, how someone treats Jesus. How Do they value Jesus? Or do they, do they despise him? Do they say, ah, I don't really need him? Does it matter to them if he's alive or, or, or dead, true or false, a liar or true to his word? Salvation from the death we deserve is really about how we treat Jesus, the Lord's anointed. And so that's what we had there in our declaration of the gospel this morning. It's that simple. He who has the son has the life. 
He who does not have the Son does not have the life. It's that simple. Do I have eternal life? Well, do you have the Son? If you have the Son, you have the life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the life. That's what the gospel is about. That's what everyone's eternity is based on. Do they have Jesus? Have they valued and treated as, as precious Jesus, or did they discard him and say, oh, I don't need him? Okay. So David treats the Lord's anointed Saul well, with respect and kindness, and this is what matters. Uh, David says that uh, for his respect to the Lord's anointed, he is considered by the Lord to be righteous and faithful. See that there in verse 23? He says, who's righteous and faithful here? I am. Why am I righteous and faithful? He doesn't go into a list of how he's a good guy. He says, I'm righteous and faithful because I've treated the Lord's anointed with value and preciousness. And that's true for us too. This morning in Sunday school, we were talking about this. How is one righteous? It's through faith in Christ. It's through saying, Jesus is valuable. Jesus is precious. I need him. I need him to be my king. I need him to be over me if I'm to be blessed and I'm to... I'm to live. And so uh, David says in verse 22, look there. Here's the king's spear, David answer, answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. Verse 23, the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. Again, the Lord rewards those who value his anointing, who value his son. That's what the gospel is. We can just present the gospel that simply sometimes if we want to, to the non-believer. Here's the gospel. The Lord will reward eternally those who value his son. That's it. David gets that. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. So if we want to be considered righteous and faithful before Almighty God, it's not sinlessness you need. It's valuing Jesus. It's receiving the Son of David as the King God has for you to save you eternally, to protect you, not from Philistines, but from your enemies of death and Satan. You don't need a perfect life. You don't need sinlessness. You need to value Jesus, to treat him as precious. John put it simply, he who has the Son has the life. B, so it's not about how good we are, for no one but Jesus earned. No one but Jesus has earned or will be able to earn his way into heaven. Galatians 2.16 uh, he's, Paul says it in Galatians 3 as well. He says it in Romans as well. Through the works of the law, no one will be justified by God before him. We don't need good works for eternal life. We need to value Jesus. We need to say, he is precious. He is who he said he was. Uh, he is the son of God. Uh, he is uh, God's choice for king. That's our escape uh, that's our escape from death. So number two, number two, for your blessing now and for all eternity, your chief task, your chief task in life is to put yourself under the leadership of the anointed one, Jesus. Your chief task in life is to put yourself under the leadership of the anointed one, Jesus. So A, there are two groups ultimately, just two in life, from Adam until the day when Jesus comes back. Just two groups. They're sheep and goats. Matthew 25. When I come back with all my powerful angels with me, me and my kingship, I'll separate the sheep from the goats. Sheep and goats. Uh, B. The sheep are under, the sheep are under Jesus' shepherding. And they're blessed by God eternally. Jesus says at the end of uh, Matthew 25, he says, you know, the, the unrighteous will go into everlasting torment, but the righteous to eternal life, the sheep to eternal life. 
John 10, verse 2. This is Jesus talking about himself as the good shepherd. Uh, Bob read it for us. Listen to these words in terms of sheep. What do sheep do? Um, the man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. That's Jesus. He's the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate. That's the father. The watchman opens the gate for the shepherd. And the sheep listen to the shepherd's voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought all his own out, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Verse 10 says, the thief of, of John 10, the thief comes only to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then in verse 14, which Bob also read for us, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay my life down for the sheep. The source of your being blessed is, being, is having Jesus as your shepherd. Being one of those sheep who hears Jesus' voice and follows him because you know his voice. That's it. Being under the shepherding of Jesus. Is it better to be under David's 600 or Saul's 3,000? David's 600. Um, it's better to be under the Lord's anointed, to be one of, one of his sheep. Even Saul acknowledges this at the end of our passage here. Look at verse 25. Saul said to David, May you be blessed. May you be blessed, my son David. You will do great things and surely triumph. David was blessed. He went on from here and he was blessed. He would be uh, acknowledged before all the people as king in 2 Samuel chapter 5. He would uh, rid Israel of all its enemies. He would expand the territory of Israel into all the, 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 the uh, lengths that God had declared to Abraham. From the, our favorite word, our, the wadi of Egypt up to the, the river, to the Euphrates River. And this is the land that David conquered for God's people. There was great blessing upon, upon David's life. And the good news was, if you, if, when he was reigning over them as king there was great blessing on them. Not because they were great, but because God's blessing, the Lord's blessing, was upon David. And the Lord blessed David in everything, in everything he did. So this thing is true for us as Christians today. New Testament, Jesus following Christians. Look how Paul talks about this in Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, 3, Paul says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. You know, there's a, a, a very proper uh, sense in which we say all of Israel in David's day under his kingship were in David. They were under David. They were under his kingship and they were blessed in him. They were blessed under his kingship. And this is true, and we see that it was David's, the sense of this with David was just a foreshadowing of how it would be true with us. In Christ, under his kingship, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing, just as even Saul acknowledges in this passage. Now see, so you need to be under Jesus because God the Father is on Jesus' side and protecting, protecting him and giving him victory over death and Satan. An honor above all. Uh, Jesus, God the Father is doing this for Jesus, just as God had done this for David. Just as he had protected, protected David from Saul and his army. Um, just as he had protected David with even just one friend beside him. Completely surrounded by 3,000 people whose sole reason for being there was to kill him. David is protected. Did you see why David got in and out of there? Verse 12. Look at verse 12. Very end of verse 12. Not because David could walk really quietly. Okay? You know, if you're on a house that's not a concrete slab, you know, and everyone's asleep, you kind of walk on your tiptoes, or, you know, at night it goes boom, 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 like that. Uh, not because David could walk really quietly or breathe really gently. The Lord was protecting David. The Lord was protecting David. The, the Lord had put all those people in a deep, 
deep sleep. Um, they were all sleeping. The Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Um, and so David gave, gave him victory. This is what Peter talks about in Acts 2.24. Even though all God's people were against Jesus, just like all Saul's army was against Jesus, God the Father gave Jesus his son victory. Verse 24 of Acts chapter 2. God raised him, the Father raised Jesus to life because death could not keep its hold on him. God the Father raised him, blessed him to honor and glory and sat him at his right hand. God the Father gave Jesus honor above all. Um, 1 Peter 3, 21-22 says that Jesus has been resurrected and has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels and authorities and powers having been put in subjection to him. So Jesus is given the place of great honor. He has victory over death. Um, just like Jesus' parable of the father um, who throws the banquet for his son, the wedding banquet for his son, to honor his son. This is what the father has done for Jesus. Uh, so it's good to be under Jesus because Jesus is the one who's protected from death and from harm. Now D, also, you want to be under Jesus, for under Jesus' headship or kingship, there's great victory for you in what matters most. There's victory for you, first of all, number one there, in life. If you're under Jesus, there's victory for you in life. Um, you experience victories over your sin nature. You experience victories over your sin nature. Romans 8 9 says, You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. If you're a Christian, if the Spirit of God lives in you, you're living by the Spirit. Verse 13 of Romans 8, by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body. This is victory in life for you and for me. Victory in life for you and for me doesn't mean zippity doo die, everything's going our way. It doesn't mean that we're not getting persecuted doesn't mean that we won't die of cancer or of a heart attack. It's not what it means. Victory for us in this life is that by the Spirit, we are putting to death the misdeeds of the body. We are able to say we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us so that we can say no to godlessness. We can say no to temptation because the Spirit of God in us is that powerful. And we can walk according to the Spirit now because he's in us instead of just according to our sin nature, walking in defeat over and over again. This is, the vic this is why we want to be under Jesus, because he gives us victory in life. He allows us to do the things that keep our marriage together. He allows us to do the things that keep our, our sons and daughters safe and even loving us. Because we have his spirit, and this allows us to say, no to the misdeeds of the body. Romans 8, 3, Paul writes, For what the law was powerless to do and what it, in, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, that is when you didn't have the spirit in you, you saw the law and you couldn't do it. It just said, ha, 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 you can't do me. <laughs> Another reason for you to be condemned. But Paul says, but God did. He gave you a spirit in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. So as saved people, as people who have been rescued and brought under the headship of Jesus, we can now live according to his Spirit and walk in his ways and fulfill the ways he has for us to live, the way he's framed us to live, so we don't have to do sinful things that, that harm us, that harm the people around us, and that harm our relationships with everybody. This is victory in life, the Holy Spirit in us, allowing us to be patient and compassionate and loving and gracious to other people, that allows us to do things that God tells us to do in his word instead of the things that we just want to do in our sinful nature. This is victory for us in life. Saul declared to David, God will give you great triumph. This is what Paul's talking about when he talks to the Corinthians. He said, we're walking in triumph because of the Spirit, even though we're beaten down and whipped and shipwrecked. Okay, number two. Under Jesus' headship or under his kingship, there's great victory for you in death. There's great victory for you in death 
because in death you will victoriously be ushered into heaven and saved from hell. You'll be ushered into the presence of Jesus. So again, verse 24 there, we have victory. We have victory over death. Um, verse 24, David says, I will be delivered by the Lord from all trouble. You know, death is kind of troubling, right? That's a pretty big trouble that we have. So when we pray for, you know, and congregational concerns, there's a lot of that kind of trouble that we're praying for. Sickness unto death. God causes sickness not to be unto, unto death. But we know that for us as believers, that even should we die, as Jesus said in front of Lazarus' grave, yet shall we live. Death for us is triumph. Paul sat in a, in a prison, either in Rome or in Ephesus, and he wrote Philippians. I think it's Ephesus, but uh, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, but he said, you know, if my imprisonment here leads to my death, I kind of want that, to be at home with the Lord. Because my death means being with Jesus. But then he says, but I think he's going to get me out of this imprisonment for your sake. Because you need me to instruct and guide you still. I, I, I kind of think the Lord's work for me here among his sheep is not yet over. But I'd rather just die and be with the Lord. That's what he says there in, in uh, uh, Philippians 1.23. Um, John sees in, in Revelation 6.9 when he's given a vision of heaven now. What he sees in heaven now is the souls of believers around Jesus' throne. This is victory over death. John refers to it else, elsewhere in the book of Revelation that says they triumphed over the grave through their testimony of Jesus. They didn't triumph over the grave by not getting killed for their faith. They triumphed by not giving up their faith in Jesus, even though it meant their death. So John says a couple of instance, a couple of times in the book of Revelation. So that's in death will be victorious, ushered into heaven, ushered into the presence of Jesus. And then number three, number three, under Jesus' headship, there's great victory for you at Jesus' return. At Jesus' return. Um, at Jesus' return, when you're under Jesus, it will be victorious. You will be victorious over physical death. So when you die before Jesus returns, if you do, if he doesn't come back today, which would be great, um, if you die before he returns, your soul will have victory over death. But when he returns, your body too also will have victory over death. And, and Paul and and John are very clear about this. Jesus is very clear about this bodily resurrection. Jesus was challenged by this, by the, by the Sadducees who didn't believe in bodily resurrection. And Jesus disproves them from the law. Uh, but also, uh, uh, Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5. And we see this occurring in, in Revelation 20. But we see Paul being very clear about it in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Spends a whole very long chapter all focused on physical resurrection. And he says if, physical resur if the physical resurrection of Jesus has not happened, and if we are not physically resurrected, then our faith is in vain. And we are to be called fools above all men. And so this speaks to Jesus victory when we return in our when he returns in our victory when he returns we have victory over physical death bob read for us this morning as well john 6 39 jesus says all the father has given me all his people everyone the father gives to me that have come here on earth to save i will raise them up on the last day that's a promise i will raise them up that's physical resurrection at the last day. That's the day of Jesus' return. Okay? So a threefold victory for us because we are under Jesus. Victory over our sin natures. Victory in walking in God's ways, which leads to great blessing in our life. So in our lives, victory over sin. At death, victory over being cast into hell, away from Jesus' presence. And then 
when Jesus returns. Victory, even physically, bodily. Um, I'm, I turned 52 this past week. Elvis and me, Dave. <laughs> Actually, he turned Elvis's 1936. So he's 20, 21, 31 years older. He was 31 when I was born. But still rocking it in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm 52 now. I had a conversation with one of our neighbors who's been a, a, a she's a mother of some uh, classmates of our, our girls, and we were having old people discussion in the gym. You know, when you're a kid, you can, you can jump any old way, and you can land any old way, and you're not even sore when you're in fourth grade the next day or the day after. And, and now, if we're very careful, we're still sore. And if we land in some funny way, we're in physical therapy for the next six weeks. <laughs> and uh, things are just breaking. You know, I had, I had uh, three years in a row, three years and three months, where I ran every single day, Monday through Saturday. Took Sundays off. Every single day. Three years, three months, and like two weeks. I had to quit because I was having heart surgery that day. Um, but <laughs> I, I didn't run that day. Uh, and, and, just, and just could do it. My body could take it. Um, right now, I can run twice a week. Three to, I'll, I'll be running three times a week in, in maybe two, three weeks from now. But just your, your body goes. But, but uh, when Jesus comes back, no way, man. I love running. I love being out among the trees. We live a half mile from the News River Trail. Literally, I run, and it's like 0.45 miles, and I'm on the News River Trail from my front door. I love running through the trees and feeling the breeze, even when it's cold out and running in cold weather as out yesterday and, and um, that's wonderful and I would just love I, I'd love to run for five hours but I can't because my body couldn't even take that as a young person uh, but but when Jesus returns there's victory there and, and that we can just our, our, our bodies are not decaying anymore um, great reason for us to be under our anointed ordained king Jesus so summary summary simple here there's one great perfect ordained man set apart and anointed to accomplish the well-being of all of God's sheep so summary most central to your present and eternal well-being is how you value or don't value God's anointed Jesus let's pray